Um, I don't know how many we have here. I know a couple here that are, are real hostesses with the mostesses. I know it's not a right word. My mother was a hostess with the mostess. She never even left the house unless she was all dolled up, kind of like Ruth Ann. And, <laughs> and uh, my mom always looked sharp in every hair in place. And, and she'd say, do you have time to, to stay for lunch? It's just going to be a little simple thing. And out would come the cut glass and, you know, the, the napkins and the little place settings. And just, it's just what she did. She was the hostess with the mostess. And we've got a couple here, and I won't mention any names, but Crystal's one. Uh, and Sarah is another. She's really good at hospitality, too. Well, we've been starting, we started the series last week called Equip for Habitation. And based upon something that I had stored away in my notes that I still don't know who said it, but it seems to be a lot of people talking about this. Now, I, as I wasn't aware of it until I read this little line that we are more equipped for visitation than habitation. We meaning the church. Yes. And as I thought about that and thought, you know what, this could be a series, started coming up with some categories. And who knows? It may expand, I don't know. But I'm trying to stay within my notes for the first couple of weeks. We talked last week that habitation is more than visitation. And visitation are those special times in your life that you remember, that you put a star next to. I remember when he saved me. I remember when he healed me. I remember when he filled me with the Spirit. I remember when he came through. I was out in the middle of nowhere uh, talking about that the other day with somebody about being on the road uh, in ministry and all the times that God just miraculously provided, all the times that we laid under the bus and laid hands on you joints and starters <laughs> and God got us down the road. And other people talking about those miraculous encounters. And, and those are visitations that we remember. But we're called to prepare a habitation for God. That when we come into his presence, whether it's in this room or anywhere else, that we know some things. That we can do things on our end and in our part to prepare and to equip a habitation for the Holy Spirit. So, as we look into the second part of that this week, I want to talk about hosting the presence of God. And perhaps the best thing to do is to start off defining that. What do I mean by hosting His presence? Well, let's look at it this way. Giving God the best of what? The best of our attention? The best of our abilities? The best of our time? Not what's just left over the best position in our lives, not the bottom of the list, but the top of the list, and giving him the place of honor. But what does that sound like? Well, all those things and more, and then continue to do that until the comfort leaves. Continue to do that until you have to willingly sacrifice something. Continue to give God the place of honor until it costs you something. Continue to give Him first place until you have to start not doing other things. Now, now let's be careful that we don't make it all about doing something. Because we're going to miss the point if we make it about doing something. Coming to church on a Sunday morning is a good way to help equip our lives and this place for the habitation. But it's not the action of coming here that does it, right? right. It's the way we come. Uh, you can be out in a cornfield and equip for habitation. It's the attitude. The great thing about doing it here is we get to do it together. We need each other. We need the church. We are not designed to be Lone Ranger Christians. Can you be saved and go to heaven without going to church? Of course. But 
is that all you're concerned about, just making heaven? Aren't you concerned about being obedient to what God has called you to do? Yeah. And the only way we can do that is to get Christ commissioned the church. Not the assemblies of God, not the Methodists, not the Baptists, but the church made up of all born-again believers in Jesus Christ. We get to do that together. When you come, let's do a practical thing. We're talking in uh, ethereal things to a degree. So let's make it practice. Let's talk about when we come together Sunday morning. How you come. Come prepared. Prepare as much before you come into these doors as you do when you're preparing to have guests over. Maybe more. Come prepared. Come prepared to give. Come prepared to give him honor. Come prepared to give him praise. Most of the time when church and give are in the same sentence, we're talking about money. And that's part of it, right? We, we give him the, the first fruits of our income, 10%. That's what tithe means. We don't get to retranslate tithe. It means tenth. Just saying. You figure out how that works out in your life, pre-tax, post-tax. You figure that out. Uh, I don't think we're bound by a legalistic view of this, but we give our best, our first fruits to God. But we come prepared to give. We come prepared to give. I, I believe that in most churches, especially in the West, the attitude of most people coming into church on Sunday morning is passive. Passive. What can somebody do for me? How good is the worship team going to be? What songs are they going to do? Am I going to like the songs? I hope the message is good this week. Uh, what, what is it going to be like, right? What, what am I going to get from this? And that's all part of we do receive from God. But this common worship experience is not meant to be passive. It's active. Amen. We're to be involved in worship. We are giving to God. We serve an audience of one. So come prepared. Come ready. To not only are you going to experience God, but you're going to give Him what He deserves. I realize that we're busy. I realize with kids and all of these different things, I realize that sometimes the clock is our enemy. But you know what? When we make time so that we're here for the worship portion of what we do, that's the giving. If we skip out on worship, we're just there to receive. Worship is when we give. When you come, don't plan your exit strategy. Don't say, okay, I'm good till about uh, 1130. And after that, it just ain't going to happen come engaged. Now you all have clocks on your phones and maybe watches, but there's none in this room for a reason. We're not trying to extend something when God says, I'm out of here, but we're not going to worry about fear of man when it comes to what God wants to do in a service. Don't plan your exit strategy. Attention to detail. I like to know what's coming next. And when I, when I plan something out, like a Sunday morning, I have a pretty good idea of what flows into what. Ready to change that when God decides to break in? Absolutely. But I've, in, in my 40 years of public ministry and almost 30 of them traveling from church to church, I've seen too many people come in who didn't prepare anything and then they blame it on God. No, that's not how you host the presence of God. That's called being lazy. That's called, oh, well, it's only church. No, give it everything you have. If you're going to sing, you're going to learn the song, learn the song. If you're going to run tech, run the tech. And they do a fantastic job, don't they? Awesome. If you're going to if you're gonna greet, greet it with everything you have. If you're going to serve, you're going to teach. It's not something you slough off on. This is always that we equip a habitation for God. This is how we host His presence. We do it with excellence. Yes. There's a difference between excellence and professional. We don't have to be professionals. 
but we do have to give it all we've got. Excellence is important. Turn off distractions. When you come to be in the presence of God, how many are like me? I'm going to carve out time and I'm just going to be in His presence and all of a sudden you think of something you got to do. Huh? Carry a notepad or open up the notepad on your phone. Write it down. Get to it later. Give him the time that he needs. The time that he wants. He wants to be here. He wants to have a habitation among us. He wants to have a habitation in your home, in, in your office, in your school, at your job. He wants to have it. We don't have to question that. So we do things so that it's not work, it's not things that make him come, it's things that, that get us engaged. Do it right. Turn off the distractions. Some of the things that we need to hear from the Word of God to encourage us that God desires this above anything. He desires relationship with us more than anything. He has made so many promises to us. If we were to sit and, and try to recount all of the promises of God in Scripture, things that we can take for granted, Things that we can say, absolutely, I know God wants this for me, right? That whole, if it be thy will garbage, stop it. Here's, the th here's some things that we don't have to pray his will on. Here, here's a couple things. Matthew 18, 20. For where two or three gather in my name, there am I with them. We don't have to pray about whether God wants to be in fellowship with us. Isaiah 41, 10 says, do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. He wants to do those things. Romans 8, 28, we know that, all, that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. It doesn't say that all things are good. All things are not good. But it does say that in all things God will work everything together for good for those who love him. He wants the best for you. Amen. You don't have to pray about that. Amen. You don't have to say, if it be thy will. He wants the best for you. These are some promises. Matthew eleven twenty eight 28 to 30. Come to me, Jesus speaking. All you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. He wants to give you the lighter load. How about that? Does that set anybody free? Do you need to be told that God isn't expecting you to work your way into his presence? That somehow you, you have to beat yourself uh, with whips or starve yourself or, or put yourself in pain, inflict pain upon you? There are people in the world that believe that the only way to get to God is to debase themselves. Now, there's a difference between that and sacrificing things so that we can get closer, absolutely. But we don't have to pray about God's will in this. He wants a habitation among us. And when we rightly host His presence, He is faithful to show up every time. What keeps Christians from hosting the presence of God? Well, a sense of unworthiness. <clears throat> I'm saved by grace through faith. Sounds good on paper, but I really don't think I am because I can't forget all of the things that I've done. Well, God forgets them. Yeah. Maybe you can't. But if they're under the blood, they're under the blood. Yes. Yes. None of us are worthy to stand before a holy God in our own righteousness, but the good thing we don't wear our own righteousness when we stand before God. Amen. We wear the righteousness of Christ. Or it could be the opposite of this that keeps us from hosting the presence of God. It could be self-righteousness. I got things under control. I'm a good person. I'm doing all right. Uh, you know, I, I gave some money to some orphans and you know, I, I go to church Christmas and Easter to kind of make an appearance. 
I'm a, I'm a good person. Well, that can keep you from hosting the presence of God, too, because if you think you've got it all handled and under control, why in the world are you going to bother with setting aside time to host the presence of God? could be a lack of discernment or a lack of appreciation for what it means to stand in His presence, a lack of understanding of, of the experience that that is and the power that's available to us, not for ourselves, but against our enemy when we stand in the presence of God. Selfishness, consumer mentality, passivity, all of these things. I come to God for what I can get. I, I come to church because I really need a way to get my bills paid. So if, if God really loves me, He'll drop money from heaven and I'll get my bills paid. And that's my sole focus on coming into His presence to get what I want. How can we practice this personally? Well, being in His presence. I say it all the time. Carve out time to simply be in His presence. And if you don't understand what I mean, just figure it out. Just work on that. Just be in His presence. If you have to say it out loud, I choose now to be in the presence of God. We don't come with an agenda. We don't come with a list of things we need. Those are okay. He wants to hear what we need. But carve out some time to be in His presence. That means we exclude everything else. We come to experience God. We do it through reading of His Word. We do it through prayer. We do it through fellowshipping with other believers. Uh, we do it through serving. All of these ways that we can get ourselves in His presence. How do we practice it corporately here? Well, by prioritizing worship. It's not just the warm-up to the sermon. It's not just the thing that happens at the beginning. Uh, so I can just kind of, you know, just sit and ignore it or not be a part of it. I can listen and critique how bad the singing was or how good the song was or how loud the system is or how warm it is in here or how cool it is in here. No, no, it's a time that we actively engage in worshiping the King of Kings. He loves to hear our worship. Prayer, taking, taking what we do seriously. You know, when we, when we do things at the have a schedule, it's not just to have a schedule. It has a purpose. It all has a purpose. When we come together to pray, there are times that we, of course, we greet one another. And it's good to to hear from one another and haven't seen each other for a couple of days, let's talk about some things we're going through, to request prayer, absolutely. But when we come together for a prayer meeting, a time of prayer, we come together to pray. We, we take the opportunity to have corporate conversation with God who wants to hear us. And part of public praying is worship. I believe worship's the highest form of prayer because we're honoring Him. Think about the pattern of the Lord's Prayer. We don't have to recite the Lord's Prayer, but think about the pattern that exists. The first thing we do, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. So we come before Him in worship, out loud, with our lips, with real words that other people can hear. This is what we do in corporate prayer. Not only does it, uh, does it increase our communication with the God of the universe, it encourages those who are praying with us. These are ways that we can practice corporately being in His presence. Plan time to practice our faith. If you're going to practice spiritual things, there's no better place to do it than right here. You're among friends, right? And, and it's, it's no place to, to be looking at someone and saying, oh, well, they didn't pray as good as I could. No, it, it shouldn't be. I better not hear that. And we don't allow Pharisees here. But it's a time that we practice in a comfortable environment where we're like encouraging one another. Yeah, go, go. Press into this. Go after God. We practice it here. We take care of our guests. <coughs> when we have ministry guests here, we try to go above and beyond. We want to bless them financially. We want to bless them with hospitality. We're not going to put them up at the cheapest hotel. Uh, we're going to have little extra things for them. And when we have guests here, many of them say, you guys went above and beyond. You know how to do it. 
I was at the mercy of churches for many, many years. And I uh, used to travel, and they would say, uh, do you come on faith? And I finally started saying, absolutely, whose faith? Just mine? That goes along with preparing. But I told you earlier about not preparing to host the presence of God. We blame it on God and say, oh, we want to be just dependent upon Him. But really what it shows is laziness. Amen. So if, I'm, if, if, if someone is, is making their living and their ministry and the worker is worth his wages, why are you going to make it so difficult for them? By expecting only their faith. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Oh, we took, it was only $27.31, but you came on faith. God will stretch it. No, he won't. He wants you to stretch. Amen. To learn how to give to God's ministers. And you do that well here. The other week, we had a special offering for Convoy of Hope. And we raised almost $1,000. That was really cool. Yeah. And we added 500 to it from, from our account. And we were able to bless them with almost 1500 bucks. What a blessing that is. You guys are good at that. But we are trying to create a culture here, right, where we, we, we host God's presence by, by hosting our guests well, another way that we host God's presence. Uh, I want to look uh, in, in uh, the Bible. We think that's a good place to look. Uh, in uh, Judges chapter 6, this is probably the most read chapter of Judges because it's a familiar story about a guy that we like called Gideon. Now, I want to give you an example of, of Gideon and how he hosted the presence of God, even though he started out with an attitude that really wasn't that great. So let's look at, uh, it's not going to be on the screen, but uh, if you have a paper one or a digital version, I encourage you to open your Bible uh, to Judges chapter 6, beginning of the Old Testament, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, Judges. And... Uh, We'll take a look uh, starting at verse 11. So here's the situation. Uh, The the Midianites were um, oppressing Israel. But it was something that God sanctioned because of Israel's disobedience. Uh, Many times we read through Scripture, God uses uh, another country, especially a pagan country, to bring judgment because of their disobedience. And that's what was happening. The Midianites were, were abusing the Israelites so much that they had to even hide their food. And Gideon was in a wine press. The wine presses would have been lower. Okay? He's down in a wine press and he's threshing grain. Well, the whole idea of threshing, threshing grain is you do it where there's wind. Because as you beat it, the chaff flies away and the grain drops. So you can imagine, you're down in a wine press, there's not a whole lot of breeze going. So things were desperate. I'm sure they weren't too thrilled about their situation. They had to hide their food and even hide the preparation of their food so that the Midianites didn't steal it. So that's the setting. But we go to verse 11. Then the angel of the Lord came and sat beneath the great tree at Ophrah, which belonged to Joash of the clan of Abiezer. Gideon, son of Joash, was threshing wheat at the bottom of a wine press to hide the grain from the Midianites. The angel of the Lord appeared to him and said, Mighty hero, the Lord is with you. Now, I don't know how you'd feel if suddenly this being that you didn't understand what this being was yet, this person came in and called you mighty hero, and here you are hiding out from people down in a wine press, you know. Mighty, he probably went, you know, look around, see if somebody else was standing there. And we, we get a little idea of maybe the, the mood that Gideon was in when he replies. Sir, Gideon replied, if the Lord is with us, why has all this happened to us? Where are the miracles our ancestors told us about? Didn't they say the Lord brought us up out of Egypt, but now the Lord has abandoned us and handed us over 
to the Midianites? Now, anybody ever been there? I mean, honestly. Where, where's all these miracles that, that I hear about? Here's what we do as human beings. We get spiritual amnesia. We tend to forget the good stuff when the bad stuff comes. We could be blessed all our lives and six months of difficulty and all of a sudden we're saying, where is God? This was where Gideon was at and we can't fault him because we've all been there too. We also got to remember that we're living in a different covenant that Gideon was living in. We're on this side of Calvary and Pentecost. We have the benefit of the indwelling Holy Spirit. But Gideon says, okay, where are all these miracles? Well, then the Lord turned to him and said, go with the strength you have and rescue Israel from the Midianites. I am sending you. Do you notice sometimes God doesn't really pay attention to our whining? It, it didn't even miss a beat. Just said, uh, yeah, whatever. I want you to go in the strength you have, right? Go in the strength you have. And I talked about that a little bit earlier this morning. We come before him with what we have. We don't come before him with what we want to have. We come before him with what we have. And this is probably one of the greatest examples in all of the Bible. We're not going to read the whole study of the whole story of Gideon, you can read that on your own. But this is one of the greatest stories in the Bible about someone who just thought so little of themselves, but God used them. I start to think that I'm not sure that people who consider themselves to be leaders make the best leaders. I'm not sure that people who come to God fully equipped are the ones that God uses. I'm convinced by the Word of God that it's usually the people who don't think much of themselves are the ones that God can use. Because if He doesn't have to empty you first, He's going to have a whole lot more success in using you for His glory. And then Gideon came back in verse 15, but Lord, he's still whining. How can I rescue Israel? My clan is the weakest in the whole tribe of Manasseh, and I'm the least in my entire family. The Lord said to him, I will be with you and will destroy the Midianites as if you were fighting against one man. And then Gideon did what we never do. Okay, Lord, but give me a sign. If you're truly going to help me, show me a sign to prove that it is really the Lord speaking to me. Don't go away until I come back and bring my offering to you. Okay, now Gideon is starting to turn. This is, this is really big. He's starting to turn. He is recognizing that he is speaking with a representative of God, but he's not quite sure to what extent this messenger is representing God. And I believe that to be true because he's still saying, but, but, but. But he knows that this is more than just a human being speaking to him. It, if we look at the, the language, it really means a messenger of Jehovah. So, the angel of the Lord. Whenever we read angel of the Lord in the Old Testament, we have to do some questioning and think. Well, how did God manifest himself? How could God, who is spirit and unable to be seen, how does he represent himself? Well, when we think about uh, the, the Christmas story, which we're coming up on soon, right? When we think about the Christmas story, we know that God sent angels. And a lot of times when we read that, the, the angels are named. Sometimes they're not. But whenever we read the phrase, angel of the Lord, if you look through a passage almost every time, at some point, the text shifts from saying the angel of the Lord to the Lord. In other words, the representative, the messenger of the Lord is speaking in full authority for God. And I wonder if some of these are not Christophanies, a, a pre-incarnate appearance, appearance of Christ. Because if we believe that the Son is eternally existent with the Father and the Holy Spirit from before creation, and we consider that Jesus was the physical manifestation of Spirit God, it's very possible 
that this was a tangible, physical manifestation that it could have been the sun in a pre-incarnate. Uh, I can't prove that one way or the other, but when I think about who Jesus is and how he manifested as a physical human being, uh, I think that this could be the case. The, thing, the, the, the greatest thing to remember and to, to take from this is that this angel of the Lord was definitely speaking for God. So Gideon had an understanding of this. This was not an ordinary human being. So within him came this desire to host this messenger. And what did he say? He said, don't go away. I want to hear what you have to say, but I'm feeling that I need to be a good host. And so he says, let me go and bring an offering to you. I mean, this, this should speak huge to us. Yes, it should. When we're in a situation where we are hearing the word of God, when we are communing with God through worship and prayer and through his word, when we hear from God as we did this morning with a, a message in tongues and interpretation, when we see God move in ways where we, we called the youth and just and prophetically said God is going to use them then we have to know that we're in his presence and we're in his presence it should create in us a desire to host just like Gideon so what did Gideon do he went and I'm going to find where I left off the angel said I will stay here until you return Gideon hurried home he cooked a young goat and with a basket of flour, he baked some bread without yeast. Then carrying the meat in the basket and the broth in a pot, he brought them out, presented them to the angel who was under the great tree. The angel of God said to him, place the meat and the unleavened bread on this rock and pour the broth over it. Gideon did as he was told, and the angel of the Lord touched the meat and bread with the tip of the staff in his hand, and fire flamed up from the rock. And consumed all that he had brought. And the angel of the Lord disappeared. When Gideon realized that it was the angel of the Lord, he cried out, O sovereign Lord, I'm doomed. I have seen the angel of the Lord face to face. Verse 23, it's all right, the Lord replied. How did the Lord reply? The angel disappeared. The Lord spoke to his heart. The Lord spoke to him that do not be afraid, you will not die. Gideon built an altar to the Lord there and named it Yahweh Shalom, which means the Lord is peace. The altar remains in Ophrah in the land of the clan of Abiezer to this day. It took a physical manifestation for Gideon to listen. It took a miraculous sign, which he asked for, that the meat and the bread was consumed even after it had been drenched with the broth. And for that manifestation of God to disappear, to get to a point where Gideon could hear God without the outward manifestation. Let me add something. If you'd have been Gideon, do you think this might have convinced you that God had spoken. I don't know if this ever happened to you, that you've entertained a messenger from God, that you brought out food, and the messenger took the tip of his staff and, and fire consumed it, and then he disappeared. That may have happened to you. Probably not. But can I tell you something? If Gideon were here today and had any clue what you have access to, he would be blown away. If Gideon were here today and had the, the knowledge that you have the Holy Spirit of the living God indwelling you, it would blow his mind. Are you serious? God himself, like, resides permanently in you? You, you mean you can, just, you can just come into his presence anywhere? He, he would have longed to look into what we too often take for granted. Gideon recognized that something bigger than himself was there, and he responded in a way that he felt he needed to do something in response. 
He brought what he had. And remember, the Midianites were stealing their food. So this food that he brought him was out of his lack. But he felt that to host the presence of God, he needed to bring his best. Of course, God used Gideon in incredible ways. Uh, defeated the Midianites with fewer people than what Midian thought they were going to need. Right? God kept whittling it down. Gideon was so well loved that they begged him to become a king. And he said no. This was in the period before the kings. God never intended to give people kings. We're still fighting that today because we just had to have a king. But this is a great sign and a great example of what it means to host the presence of God. We bring our very best. We, even in our doubt, Gideon had doubt. He doubted God. And he said, I need a sign. Even in his doubt, he brought his very best. And God confirmed, did he not? The supernatural sign of the fire that consumed the offering pointed Gideon to God. The, the realization, the confirmation of who he had been talking to. Maybe he suspected that he was talking to uh, a manifestation of God, but now it had been confirmed. This is the one who called him a mighty warrior. What's God calling you that you don't want to believe? What is God calling you to that you say, there's no way I could do it? Can I suggest that if you simply get in the habit of hosting the presence of God, he will also make this clear to you of how he's going to do it? Can we come to him in faith that says, I don't have to see it with my eyes. I believe it because you said it. And in response to that, I'm going to, in my life, in my home, at my workplace, in my car, in my church, get in the habit of hosting the presence of God. Hosting the presence of God tells him that we want to know him, not just his mighty works. Hosting the presence of God tells him that it's, it's fellowship with him that is, is our highest goal and our highest aim, not what we can get from And, and hosting the presence of God at a time where we feel like we don't have that much to offer, like Gideon did, shows that our heart is hungry for more of God, that we want the real thing, that we don't want religion, that we don't want outward uh, signs, that we don't want ritual and just going through the motions. We want God. We want to know Him. And we expect him to do what he said he's going to do. Hosting the presence indicates our hunger for fellowship so intimate that we do not put our limitations on generosity. You become generous people in response to what God is telling you to do. I've said it how many times. We have 80, 90 people here today, plus what's downstairs. That many people in a town of this size can do untold things for the glory of God. Just unimaginable things for the glory of God. It's a matter of how hungry are you? How desperate are you to be used? How, how, how sure are you that God is speaking? How willing are you to even in, in what you perceive as lack to have a generous attitude about hosting the presence of God. Some people host the idea of the presence without ever hosting the presence. It's like some people get together and talk about praying, but not praying. Or we talk about reading the Bible, but we don't read it. Or we talk about being in church, but we don't do it. We talk about being generous without doing it. Some people worship worship. That's, a, that's an interesting thing going on today. Are you aware of the phenomenon? That there are, there are churches out there that don't claim to be Christian churches, but yet they have worship times just like we do. 
They worship worship. They like the idea of it. It's like a rock concert. And you know, it's funny. Yesterday, uh, Friday night and yesterday, a bunch of us, a bunch of us guys went to the men's conference over at Christian Life Assembly. That's a big church. And of course, they have, they have the lights and the fog and all that. And they put, the, they put the fog in there so that you can see the light beams. If you didn't have the fog, you can't see the light beams. And some people will look at that. And they were kidding around. Terry said, so, Pastor, when are we going to get lights and fog back at <laughs> I said, I, I don't see it happening. I don't think it fits our personality. But then I got thinking about it. You know what? There are people that will criticize that who will do nothing to host the presence of God. And, and I say, well, if you have fogs and lights, do it well. If you have a huge screen, do it well. If you have all these extra, do it well. Do it as unto the Lord. If you don't, that's fine. Do what you do well. I would rather see full production done right than to see laziness done wrong. Too many people will criticize that. Now talk about all the things that you shouldn't do that in church. Rewind a hundred years and all of us would be heretics for what we're doing today. That I wouldn't be up elevated behind a pulpit. That I wouldn't be wearing a tie. That heat? You have heat? Sound system? That's heresy. So, anyway. That was the side trip I wasn't going to take. I'd rather, I'd rather see it overblown and done in the right attitude that says, this is so important that I want to do everything to show God that we value his presence. That's hosting the presence of God. You can do it with or without lights and fog. You can do it with or without a sound system. You can do it with or without orange pews. But it's the way that we come before him. This is so valuable to me that I'm going to bring him my very best. Attention to detail matters. It's not for our glory, but for God's. Amen. We can be equipped for habitation. When we come, come ready to worship. Amen. Come, come just busting at the seams. I cannot wait to get into that room. And with other people that I love, I cannot wait to just extol his virtue and his glory. I can't wait to raise my hands toward heaven and sing at the top of my lungs whether I can carry a tune or not. I can't wait to to just say, praise the Lord, hallelujah. I can't wait for him to make me different than the way I walked in. I can't wait. Come ready. Come ready to worship. Come ready to give in every way. Come ready to give. Gideon gave his very best, and it was incinerated, but it served that purpose, didn't it? Come ready to give. Come ready to give your worship. Come ready to give your time. Come ready to, to step into a deeper relationship with him. Get ready to take on what that means. If it means I've got to study more, then study more. If it means I have to show up here more, then show up here more. If it means I have to to network with people away from here to stay close, then do it. Whatever it takes. Come ready to listen. Not just to people who are in the front. Come ready to listen to God. Come ready to listen. Come ready to let God change our minds. Like Gideon. What could I do? That could never happen. Come ready to let God change your minds. Come ready to do whatever it takes to know God. Whatever it takes, I've got to know Him more. Come ready to fully consecrate yourself. That means whatever I'm hanging to, hanging on to that is not of God but of the world that I just think I have to keep hanging on to, get ready to let it go. And then hang on. It's going to be a wild ride. Come ready to serve. 